the academy is not possible without so many businesses stepping up and paying it forward. You know, when we talk with companies in the region about why they should get involved and get engaged in the Young Entrepreneurs Academy, usually the response is, yes, I want to do it. And imagine if this academy had been around when I was growing up, when I was launching a business. And that's what it's all about, really investing and unlocking the potential in the young aspiring entrepreneurs of tomorrow. And the academy really starts with great leadership. We are so fortunate to have three amazing instructors, two that hail from the LSU EJ Uso College of Business, Fahim Abbasi and Dr. Sonia Wiley, along with Kevin Lyle, the business leader and entrepreneur. And our academy is led by a phenomenal executive director, Sarah Munson. At this point, Sarah, do you want to share the YEA experience? Thank you, Deborah. And let me just say kudos to our instructors for creating an amazing learning environment for our students this year. Although we are meeting via Zoom each week, it really feels like we are in the classroom together. So let me start by painting a picture of the YEA experience from the perspective of our students. Channing Hall is a past graduate of YEA and a theater enthusiast. So after getting to know her classmates from throughout the Nine Parish area, Channing was ready to get started with building a business from the ground up. Field trips like this one to walk-ons are a great way for our students to see firsthand the results of local entrepreneurs' hard work. And those field trips have continued in our virtual setting. Asking questions and interacting with other business leaders is a great way for our students to learn. Channing, like all our students, was paired up with a mentor to develop her business plan, and a graphic designer worked with her to create a brand that communicated the purpose and tone of her business. And she had multiple opportunities to fine tune her pitch in front of her peers. Her final step before launching was to file her business with the Louisiana Secretary of State's office. And then she was ready to confidently pitch her business at our annual investor panel event. And for all her hard work and preparation, Channing received seed funding to help her with startup expenses for her theater operations app, Backstage. And this year's class of students is rapidly approaching this key event. And we hope that you will join us as they pitch for seed funding to launch their businesses on March 3rd. So we're here tonight for our annual CEO roundtable. And while we typically gather in person for this event, we still expect a lively discussion here tonight. First, we'll have a moderated discussion with our panel and then an opportunity for students to ask their questions, to learn valuable lessons from our panelists. So let's get down to business. Our moderator this evening is Stephanie Regal, editor of the Greater Baton Rouge Business Report and host of her own weekly radio show, Out to Lunch. Stephanie, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here tonight and so happy to be a part of this event. I, this is a wonderful organization and you all are doing so much and I'm so impressed that you've been able to pull this year off given all of the challenges and that we can celebrate here tonight with so many great business leaders who will share their stories. So just to introduce them, we have with us T. Brown, president of GMFS, Terry Fontenot, CEO Emeritus of Women's Hospital, Norisha Kurtz Glover, President NRK Construction and Board President of the Junior League of Baton Rouge. And as anybody who's been a Junior League member knows, that is a job all onto itself. It's an entire career. Raymond Jetson, President and CEO of Metromorphosis and Newton Thomas, Founder of the Neutron Group. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you all so much for being with us. And I'm just gonna go around and, and ask y'all some different questions. And T, I think I'll start with you. Just give us a little bit, what is the, what is the background of your story? Give us a little bit of an idea of, of how you got to be where you are. Well, thank you, um, Stephanie. This is a, a great opportunity for, for me to 
express my appreciation for all the hard work that these students have, have been doing over the course of the last six months. I mean, as I feel entrepreneurship is the, the foundation of how we, we grow our community. And I'm really encouraged to hear more about the work that they're gonna be doing tonight. But a little bit about me. Um, I grew up here in Baton Rouge and my grandfather started an organization in 1948. My father ran it for, for a number of years. That organization met a untimely demise uh, in 1998 and was forced to basically decide what I was gonna do with my career. And I took, took the opportunity to do what I'd been doing at the time, which was mortgage lending and went with 23 other people. And we started GMFS in May of 1999. And so we're coming up on, you know, finishing up our 22nd year in business. Like I say, you know, we have had 18 good ones. Um, we've had two really hard ones. And, you know, it's been a really fun event to see the growth of the company. We went from 23 employees to 165, back down to 40. Now we have over 320. Um, but, you know, our business is, is a little bit, is cyclical. And, uh, but we've been able to really take advantage of, of doing some things and diversifying how, how our operation works through not just origination, but also servicing the loans that we, uh, that we originate. But again, I'm really glad to be here and thank you for this opportunity. Wonderful, thank you so much. Terry Fontenot, I wanna to go to you next because I know when you were growing up, most girls wanted to be nurses, maybe a few adventuresome ones wanted to be doctors. Did it, you or anybody you know aspire to be a hospital administrator? No, I, not, I certainly did not. I didn't even realize that was a profession. I never gave it any thought at all. My, um, my original goal out of high school, I married right out of high school, was to be a mother, a stay-at-home mom with three children. And um, that didn't work out. My, my first marriage failed. And I realized, because I had a daughter at the time, that I needed to go back to college because I didn't ever want to have to rely on anyone else. And so I chose accounting and ended up uh, becoming a certified public accountant and moved into hospital finance. So that's the way I found my way into the healthcare field and just loved it. I, I was in that um, almost less than 35 years, um, the last 23 as the CEO of Women's Hospital. And it, it's just such a rewarding field. It's, um, it's not, it is entrepreneurial. When I first started out in healthcare, hospitals were not entrepreneurial at all. They didn't do any advertising. There was no such thing as a marketing department. It was kind of considered unethical. Mm -hmm. But now it's a very uh, complex business. It's very highly regulated. It's uh, very visible and it's really important. We've certainly seen through this COVID pandemic really how critical uh, a stable and vibrant healthcare system is in communities. So I've been honored to have served in, in, in the non-clinical side. Um, I, I don't have a clinical background at all. In fact, I, the only time I've ever been in the hospital really was to have two children. And I would, I would tell people, just don't let me near the needles or the blood because I, I don't do well with that. But, um, but on the administrative side, the strategy side, the community asset side, it, it, it was very, it's really varied and diverse. And that's what I really liked about it. Wonderful. Well, I'll jump around. Uh, Raymond Jetson, you have an interesting trajectory at, from a, a reverend of a, a very thriving church in Baton Rouge to now metromorphosis. Tell us a little bit about that path and that transition and how you move from ministry to what metromorphosis does today. Oh, you need to unmute yourself there. That's certainly going to be in the, the latest uh, Webster's Dictionary, uh, the, <laughs> the 2020 contribution. Uh, you're on mute. Please forgive me. Uh, I, I just wanted to say thanks a lot to, to YEA for this opportunity. And it's been a joy to read about these tremendous young people. Uh, the one thing that has remained consistent for me is a desire to make a difference, to have impact. Uh, and one of the things that, that made its way on my radar a few years ago uh, was this whole concept of social entrepreneurship, uh, this ability uh, uh, to do well while doing good. 
Uh, and so Metro Morphosis is a social enterprise. Uh, we certainly operate on many business principles, but we are focused on uh, how you make a difference uh, in inner city neighborhoods in particular. A and for me, the thing uh, is recognizing the importance of time and seasons. Uh, and where is it that I can be in that moment and have the greatest impact and, and make a contribution in, in the world around me? And so that's gone from elective office. I served four terms in the legislature. Uh, I, it's gone into government. I worked in the Department of Health and Hospitals. Uh, I ran a nonprofit post Katrina. And for 23 years, I was a pastor of a church. And I have been doing doing metromorphosis non uh, at full time uh, since 2018, uh, but started it in 2010 uh, after a two year fellowship on social impact at Harvard. And so it's finding that place and understanding what you do is more important than the role that describes what you do. Fantastic. And Norisha Kurtz Glover, you are involved in so many things such a recognized community leader at a young age and running a company at the same time. How do you juggle it all? Ooh, um, who says I'm juggling it all? Um, <laughs> that's what I like to remind people. Um, we can do a lot of things and we can have the things we want, just maybe not all at the same time. Um, so a little bit about me is that um, I'm originally from Tioga, Louisiana. Um, went to LSU for undergrad and my master's and during that time, um, I actually started to intern for the LSU Foundation, which was my introduction to fundraising. Um, after I graduated um, from LSU, I actually moved to DC for a little while, California and Virginia. And in all of those states, I was involved um, in education fundraising. And that was really important to me because I was the first one in my family to graduate from college. Um, and so making sure that people have the opportunity should they choose to attend college um, was really important for me and work with organizations that supported that work was also really important. Um, after 13 years of fundraising, um, I was looking for something different, which is funny because I just joined Star Hill Church as well, where Pastor Justin had just started talking about time and season. And um, I remember having many conversations with him about what is it that I'm going to want to do with my life next. And um, I let people know that I was interested in managing people and projects and budgets, that that's where I thought my strengths were. And I had a friend approach me and say, have you ever thought about construction? And I was like, no, I haven't. Um, so I nerded out. I researched the Bureau of Labor Statistics and what it said about construction and where the industry was going and where women had a role in it and what were the trades that were growing and what were those or not. And I thought to myself, well, I can do this. I will go ahead, I will give it a try. And if it works, um, then great, then I have found my new place. And if, um, and if it doesn't work, then I'll go back to fundraising. And so that's what I have been doing since 2015. And since that time, I've continued to volunteer and serve in different organizations, including the Junior League of Baton Rouge. Um, and I think that we find the time to do the things that are really important to us. That doesn't mean that there won't be times that we're pulling our hair out thinking, why did I do this? But we will find a time to manage it and realize that even that insanity and balancing all of it is only temporary. It's a special time and season in your life. And then that time will be different unless you're like me and you'll sign up for something new and then be again, why did I decide to do this? <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, Newton Thomas, tell us about some of the high points on your entrepreneurial journey. Whoops, you're also on mute. Unmute. Here we go. Now you should be able to hear me. Yep. Um, I, I read some of the potential questions that y'all would ask and the irony was I felt embarrassed because I didn't feel like they fit me that well. Um, but my deal was that um, I guess probably I'm, I grew, I mean, my time when the kids that we've got here as a part of Yay, uh, the big thing that was going on and a lot of us are products of what's going on in our society at our young ages, and they help form what we believe in. Well, for my era, I was going to college in the early 60s. Uh, I'm an older guy. And, uh, and so what was going on was the Vietnam War. And it was uh, radically affecting the young people in America because there was a draft 
and we were in a war that everyone was against. And the reality is without being an insider, you fully knew that the government was misleading the American people about what was going on. And it was at the same time that the president we had was impeached, Nixon, and he did things that were, you know, just flat out illegal uh, associated with political um, activities. And so he was impeached for that. So I grew up in a formative period when there was an awful lot of display of what you would call poor values organizationally out there. I'll never forgotten, I tell it to my employees as one of the colloquial stories that I tell. But when I was in high school, I came home and my dad, my mother was a college professor at LSU and my dad worked in a plant and not at a high level in the plant. And he was very upset at the dinner table, which was unusual. I kind of had an idyllic childhood, went to high school at the university school, got a great education. We had a farm. So I would go to the farm with my dad and have the benefits of having an exposure to a rural life. And um, so, and they're just a very loving and close family. And here was my dad upset at the dinner table and he was talking about it. And he had a grievance with a company that he worked for. And he had worked there for 40 years at the time. And he was upset because he had a grievance. And so they were gonna listen to his issues. And what he said was, as he went in and he went to an HR person in the company that he had never met and that they didn't know him, he could have been the best at his job in the entire company. He could have been the worst, but there was no intimate personal knowledge of him and his performance. And what she did when he's describing his issue that he had, they got out a book and read out of the book as to what was the way the company would react to his issue. And it really bothered him because he had spent his entire adult career working for a company that he did feel dedicated to. And he felt like they were not reciprocating with him as an employee. They were treating him as a number. And uh, he really resented it. And it was very impactful on me when I've got a dad that, you know, obviously you love your dad and, and he was that upset with the organization that he had spent his life working for. And um, so I came out of it, um, one of the questions is, if I was exposed to a yay, would it affect it? But I wanted to go into business because I wanted to create an organization live, that lived by the values that I believed in and would truly treat its employees as a part of a family and treat them personally and be open and honest with them. And uh, so my goal in life was I wanted to be successful, but I really wanted to be able to form my own business. So I got to create the policies and the way that we would deal with our employees. And my experiences around organizations did not tell me that that was a, norm a normative job that you could get where you would be treated extremely well. So my drivers were not entrepreneurial in the traditional sense of it, but they were associated with values. And I guess the good summary of that story is, is that I went into the construction. When I was gonna interview to go to work, I did not wanna work for a big company because I felt like, I mean, I could have, I got out in a period in the 60s where there was tremendous employment demand. I had a lot of offers from a lot of companies. The realities were most of them were not companies that I really believed operated by high value. So um, what I did was go to work for a real small company because I felt like by working in a small company, I would get exposure to all of the things that were going on in the company and be more knowledgeable and learn more so that if I went in business for myself, which is what I wanted to do, I would have more experience. If I was in a big corporation, I could have been in a department or I would have been 
in a cylinder as it's called in a lot of the, and I wouldn't get as broad of an exposure to how to run a company. So I went to work for a small company and um, lo and behold, once I was there, it was acquired by a public company. So here I was back in the environment that was not the environment I wanted to be in. And the people that acquired that company actually ultimately made me the president of the company, uh, which is a strange story because I'd only been there for two years and they made me the president of the company. And ultimately they proved that I couldn't work for them. I mean, they <laughs> displayed horrible values and uh, made me realize that I could not work with them. And the importance anyway. of values, you know, is so great in the, in the success of a company and in the success of a business. And I love the way that you, you know, that you touch on that and bring that out. What other traits do you all think are important in, in running a successful company and in entrepreneurship? What, what do you see, T, as the most uh, important quality of a successful entrepreneur? Obviously, the values that Newton spoke about go without saying. What else? Well, yeah, I, mean, I think it's certainly honesty, being honest with yourself and being honest with your employees. I mean, one of the things that's really important, you're not always going to make the best hires. There are going to be situations where you need to have to sit down with an employee, but you need to be honest with them. You need to be able to, to maybe this isn't the profession that they need to be in, or maybe they need to make a, a slight adjustment in, in what they're doing in order for them to be successful. And I think if you're not honest, then you're really not giving your employees the best opportunity to be successful. But I do agree with Newton. I think, you know, core values are critical. And that's one of the things we have here is, you know, change in lives. And what we do when we say change in lives, it's we want to first start with changing the lives of our employees. And if we change the lives of our employees in a positive way, then they'll change the lives of our customers. And then in fact, it'll move all, all out into the community. And so um, it's a very, very important point that, that uh, Newton was mentioning. And, and what about you, Terry Fontenot? What, what do you see as some of the most important qualities of a well, successful entrepreneur or business? Passion, first and foremost. You have got to love what you and believe in what you're doing, particularly if you're trying to build an organization. Um, it's, it's humbling. It is uh, being authentic is really critical because your employees will know if you're an imposter. I don't care how good of an actor or actress that you are. So I, I think just being really passionate about the work because there will be there will be days that it's really hard and you're wondering why am I doing this? And in my case, when I would have a really bad day, I would just go upstairs to the newborn nursery and look at all the infants. And, <laughs> and that was a kind of a, a really nice way place to go and, and a way to get me grounded. Um, and I also want to mention something related to the core values and that T and Newton have talked about because that is very, very foundational. Uh, and I believe it's really important to success, the passion, the honesty, the, thing, the values, the things of the mission mentioned. We used to say, no mission, no margin. And I truly believe that if you are passionate and you are providing a really high quality product or service, People will recognize that. They will appreciate that. You will easily differentiate yourself because there's so many bad products and services out there. And that will breed success, I think, faster than any kind of multi-million dollar marketing campaign or these really, you know, world-class hires, any of that. It's, it's really just being authentic and true, passionate and honest and core values. Marisha, what do you think? So with me being in construction, integrity is everything because our industry doesn't necessarily have a reputation for that. But that one's already, already been shared. I'd like to say that I want people to think about collaborative spirit and you can't have it in one part of your organization and then not have it in another part of, the, part of your organization and think that it's going to work. So I'm writing notes as I'm thinking about the things I'm gonna share, but I think about having a collaborative spirit with whoever I choose as my client because I want them to know that I'm on their team I think it results in a much more successful project. I want that with my employees because you don't want the friction that comes or underhandedness or, um, or any of that. You just wanna make sure your projects like run smoothly. And if you have a collaborative spirit with your employees, that can certainly, um, it certainly adds value to the work that you're doing. 
In construction, I have a lot of subcontractors. And before I start my projects, we have a team meeting where I let them know that we are to be collaborative. So I don't want one subcontractor doing something that's going to make the next subcontractor's work a bit more difficult to do. We're all in this project together. So how do we make sure that we are looking out for each other? And then also being collaborative with others who are in the industry. So I'm not going to get every single project, but that doesn't mean that I need to bad mouth or talk bad or anything about the other um, um, other professionals who are in the industry. And you just don't know when there may be an opportunity to work together. So if you always have that attitude of I'm um, sharing opportunities or letting you know something about um, what I learned or here's something that's changing that might be helpful for your company. Um, you do it because it's the right thing to do, but also it ultimately comes back to you in positive ways and helps you grow in your company and the industry as well. And Reverend Jetson? I encourage people to understand the difference between the content and the container. The content of the, is the essence of what it is that I'm trying to do. Why am I really starting this business or this, this organization? How am I intending uh, to make a difference, whether it's in the lives of customers or the people who work with me? And that, that's the content. The container is the business model or the approach that you have chosen. The container can change. The content, the essence of why you're doing it remains the same. And when you are clear on what the content is rather than the container, then you're able to adapt as the inevitable, inevitable need to change comes along. Those are all such, such good answers and, and speaks to why you all are so successful and, and run such successful businesses. But, you know, with success becomes, comes failure. And most often the people who are most successful have experienced failures and learned from their mistakes. Uh, Newton, what was one of the biggest mistakes in your career that, that taught you and helped you get to be where you are? Well, um, as some of the T said, first of all is honesty. Um, and if you make a mistake and you're the leader, you need to just acknowledge it. And you've got to have a culture where people can tell you what they think. If they think you're doing something wrong, they've got to have the freedom to be able to express it. And you've got to be able to suck it up and listen and then try to do the right thing. Um, we have a culture that we really try to promote within the company that we don't go try to find blame. If something went wrong, we're not looking for someone to blame it on. We're trying to understand what went wrong and understand the processes and try to put things in place to where we won't repeat our mistakes. And I've told them I'm a fountain of knowledge on mistakes because I've made them all. And so if I can recognize it and communicate it effectively that we don't make the same mistake over and over again. We go to some unbelievably long links with what we're describing. We do an annual survey in my company and it's a set of 50 questions and uh, about the operations of the company, the departments, the division you're in, or the company that you're in. And employees fill this out. And it can be either gonna be done online or it can be mailed in. And we compile that. And then we go with each manager going up the group and they're getting the results of a survey of their employees. And it's a confidential survey. So um, it kind of sounds like at first the management team was very upset about it because they felt like, gee, you're making, you know, you're putting me under the microscope. And there's, I won't bother y'all with the story, but I did it to myself first that, you know, I had to, all of the management got to give me a critique. And then I had to, the report was published and I had to address what I was going to do to address any issues that were in there. And um, so that was how I got the buy-in of the management team that we were gonna be doing this, is that I'm subjecting myself to it. So it started at the top and we did a survey of employees going into the organization. But that's we- so, that, that, I don't know, excuse me, that's a, that's a fantastic example. You know, we take that annual survey, we have a facilitator who will meet with the people in that group with that manager and try to understand why they were saying what they said and what are the grievances, then that manager is required to have an action plan of how to address 
the issues that our employees are most concerned about. And so when you then come back and are dealing with the issues that the employees feel, well, certainly they have to look at that and say, these people are being serious. They're not just saying things, they're listening to us and they're understanding issues. And um, I think that's been an instrumental too. Yeah, One of the problems great. that I, that it, people that are in the entrepreneurial program here, you need to discover is it, is your goal of an organization that can be small and are you the one who is gonna be doing these critical functions or do you wanna hire people and you're gonna have people that are supposed to be executing this plan? Well, well then I that gets you in a tremendous world of trying to make this be an organizational plan. Sure, and no, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a good point that we will try to get back to if we have time. But I want to give the others an opportunity to tell us about maybe a, a, an experience or a learning, an experience, a mistake that you learned from. Um, Terry Fontenot, what, what do you think? Do you have yeah. a painful story uh, to share? Well, it, the, the story that comes to mind, and it's related to career progression, is it, it seemed like a mistake at the time, but it turned out to be a real opportunity. And so that's really the, the point that I wanted to make. Sometimes mistakes turn out to be learning opportunities, they may actually be uh, business opportunities. So my first uh, position in a hospital was as a chief financial officer at St. Francis Medical Center in Monroe. And I was there for four or five years and I really loved healthcare and I felt like I wanted to, to progress in my career and the hospital had always been run by a nun. And I wasn't planning on being a nun, I, I had remarried, I had two children by then, so I don't think I would qualify. So I had an opportunity to become the chief financial officer at a health at a system of hospitals in Southwest Florida, headquartered in Fort Myers. So we moved down there. My family moved with me. My husband was able to transfer his job. We were there for a year. And after six months, I realized I do not like this health system and I don't like living here. This is the tropical north. This is not the south. And so... <laughs> So moved, but looked for my first opportunity back to Louisiana and ended up being in Opelousas at a, a rural, it's a large, but it's a rural hospital. So I had gone from a 450 bed faith-based hospital to a 250 bed rural hospital. And then after that, and I was there for five years. And while I was there, then my, my responsibilities expanded beyond finance. I was uh, put in charge of the support service departments, ancillary service like radiology and lab. I started negotiating the physician contracts for the emergency room, things like that. So I was able to expand my role. Mm -hmm. When I came to Women's in Baton Rouge, I came as the CFO, but it was understood that I would move into the COO role, which I eventually did and then became the CEO. So I, it, was, it seemed like a mistake. It seemed like a bad mistake at the time, but I don't believe that I would have gotten out of that finance track had I not gone to, to uh, it, things had not rolled out like they did. No, it's so great. And, and a story with a happy ending. T, yes. what about you? Do you have an experience or a mistake? It seemed like a mistake at the time that really led to success. Oh, um, certainly many, many mistakes. Um, you know, and I, and I tell, you know, myself and others that really principally that's, the best way that I learn is through mistakes or pain. Um, you know, during success and everything's going well, there just, you know, there's just a little, maybe not as much intensity. I think I, I thrive personally best when, when things are, are more challenging and when you have to really face, you know, very, you know, tough decisions or, or change of directions. And, and certainly we, we faced that as an organization in 2007 when we were a leading indicator of what was going to happen in the, in the, the great crash. And, of 2008 and nine. And, and again, that's when our organization had to shrink. We had to shrink significantly. We had to go down about 25% of what we were before and really pulling the people together to, to be able to figure out if we were gonna be able to make it out of the, out of the situation it was, was a very humbling and difficult situ, you know, scenario where you had to let people go that were very talented, but we just didn't have the resources in order to be able to continue to, to support it. But fortunately, the good news is things bounced back for us and we've been able to hire back a large percentage of those folks. And so as difficult as it was then, it's just, you know, the, the joy of being able to see the organization go get through that process, which many, many, you know, vast majority of organizations like ours in 2007 did not make it through that period of time. And so 
I tell people, I think one of the reasons we did was because we're in Baton Rouge and nobody in New York knew how to get us. Uh, <laughs> so we were, we were, we were fortunate that we, uh, we didn't, we weren't right next door to them. But, but no, it's been a, it's been an amazing ride. And I encourage, you know, these young entrepreneurs to, you know, you're going to, you're going to see opportunities and, you know, when you start, you're going to have to pivot and make adjustments. And that's just being flexible and, and understanding what, what you can do at various times and maybe you have to retreat and, and, and move in a different direction, but being, being flexible and keeping your head high and, and continuing to push forward is the key. Absolutely. Marisha, what do you think? So um, when I started the company, I happened to look upon um, a guy who was kind of a jack of all trades. And so he was doing my carpentry work for me. He was doing my flooring work for me. And he did a good job, but I would not say that he did a phenomenal job. And so occasionally I got feedback from people that they were not pleased with his work. So I had another commercial job that was a really, really great opportunity for me. And he just did not deliver on me. And I think that the lesson um, that I learned is that I knew for a while that, I prob that he probably no longer needed to be with my team. But because he had been with me for so long and I can be loyal to people, I didn't want to let him go. Um, but, but he messed up on those other projects so badly, I did have to eventually let him go. And so I think as... Um, as y'all are starting your organizations and you're going to have people who are excited to be a part of your team, it's going to be really great. And you're going to be want to be loyal to a lot of people. And there's certainly nothing wrong with being loyal, but there will come a time when there are individuals who are on your team that unfortunately you will have to let them go. And that will be one of the toughest decisions that you make, but it's absolutely something that I think entrepreneurs encounter. And that's such a tough, such a tough position to be in, but, but so important, you know, to help somebody find their place, maybe where they're a better fit too. Uh, Reverend Jetson, what's, what's been a big learning experience for you or a mistake that helped you get to where you are today? So one of the mantras that I repeat often to lots of people uh, is that chemistry trumps credentials. Uh, and I learned that uh, the hard way. Uh, I made a hire early on based upon someone's sterling resume. And during the interview, there, there were uh, just a kind of couple of things that, that, that caused me to, to have a bit of uneasiness, but the credentials were just so sterling. Uh, and it was about six months into the relationship that I realized that the chemistry between myself and this person and this small and fledgling team that I was building, the chemistry just did not work. Uh, and like Narisha, uh, I took a bit long uh, in making the decision to terminate the relationship. Uh, but when you are building something, particularly building from the ground up, you need people that you have chemistry with uh, who share your passion, who share your vision for the work. Uh, and so the mistake I made was being falling in love with a resume rather than understanding the importance of relationships. Very wise. And I know a lot of wisdom in business comes from reading books written by famous business people. Do you all do that? And if so, is there a, a favorite business guru that you follow or just a, a successful entrepreneur here or elsewhere that you admire and look to? T? I would say that, that a prerequisite of, of business would be Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think that's just a great foundation to mm -hmm to be able to start with. But no, it's, uh, you know, it's always good to be able to, I've subscribed to the Harvard um, Business Review and it's interesting to be able to see some of the different articles that come out of, they're ranging from compensation to management related uh, discussions. And for me, it's easier to kind of read a 10 or so page uh, article than it is to go through a 250 page book. I just, maybe it's my ADD, but uh, that's just better for, better for me. But, I would, if you have not read that uh, Stephen Covey book, I mean, it's, I think hundreds of millions of copies have been, been published. Terry, what about you? Yeah, I, I don't really have a favorite management book. I've read all of those that are the, the kind of the um, gold standard. I have, have always read my trade journals in healthcare and leadership. Right now, I'm involved in boards and in strategy. So I tend to read more articles and, and books related to that and leadership. So I, you know, I think those are all really, really 
important things to try to stay abreast of because the the whole profession does change. It's it's very different today in the way you interact with teams. You empower everyone. It's very collaborative. It's very inclusive. Back in the 1950s, it wasn't like that. That was a small group of generally white men that were in a room with cigars that were making all decisions and coming out on the shop floor and telling people what they were going to do. So, you know, I think it is important to, to stay on top of that. As far as um, is there a leader that you most admire yes, or look at? Yes, there is. I am crazy about Elon Musk. And so <laughs> if I could invite somebody to dinner, that's who that's who I would want to invite to dinner. And so and so I do follow him. I, I read what he's Very doing. Very interesting. As weird as he can be at sometimes, I just think he's brilliant. And I like him <laughs> because he takes risk. And I, you know, and and I think people should when we were talking about mistakes. You shouldn't look at it as a mistake. It's an opportunity to learn. And if you're not making any mistakes, then you're not pushing yourself hard enough and you're missing some real opportunities. So that's that's who I, that's the leader that I'm following right now, Elon Musk. Who is the leader you're following, Norisha? I don't know that I would say that there's like a particular leader that I'm following, but what I will say is... Um, John Maxwell has some really great stuff that he puts out. And I'm not saying this because it's someone who's on there, but actually the John Maxwell, he has a devotional. Mm -hmm. So it's like part of my leadership, part of my spiritual, making sure that's like combined in my, in my, um, in daily work, which I think is really important because I'm in my office right now and I'm really my only employee. And so sometimes I'm just like in my own head. Um, so making sure that I have something to center me, um, it's really, really important. But other than that, it's, it's a lot of it's about me um, reading a lot of industry stuff or pulling on local people who I really respect. Great. Thank you. Reverend Jetson. Stephanie, because of the space that Metro Morphosis occupies as a social enterprise, uh, I'm in between the Harvard Business Review and the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Uh, much like T, my attention span is better suited uh, for, for, uh, for shorter documents. Uh, but I am a fan uh, of Rosa Beth Moss Cantor uh, from the Harvard Business School. Uh, she's written some really great things. Uh, plus, she's an awesome follow on Twitter. Uh, which is where I pick up some really good nuggets. That's very good to know. And what about you, Newton? Who, who is your, a leader you've looked up to or admired or learned from? Well, I would add one comment from an earlier, one of the mistakes, and this is something that the entrepreneurs that are listening in on this, one of the question becomes, I, when I started my business, I got two partners that I brought into the business, people that I had gone to engineering school with that I was very close to, and knew their skills and they were very talented. So they came in with as partners because I was smart enough to know you need to have really talented people be on your team. And I heard this doesn't come across egotistical, but what happened was uh, they were, one was strong and Norissa would identify with this, that his skill sets were, he ran the estimating group to bid work and would, you know, was just unbelievably work ethic and talented and um, a great smart person. The other partner was running construction, which is actually a different skill set of managing people that are building these projects and working those relationships. And we were just an ideal team. And let's just say the first 10 years of the company, because we had a division of responsibility, I ran the accounting and the overall strategic planning of the corporation. So we worked real well together. And I hate to say this, but the problem was the company outgrew my partners. And that, I'm sure that could sound very egotistical, but they were very strong at running a department and they were hands-on and they were working with the people that work for them. And they were providing a leadership role almost in a hands-on direct manner. And as the company got bigger, take all this the right way, at one point in time, uh, a year or so ago, we had like 4,000, 4,500 employees. Well, the role of a manager as you're getting that big is no longer hands-on. It is truly a managerial leadership role. And one of the cultural differences they had is our, we were talking, I was talking earlier about 
trying to institute a strong case of this is the values. And the values are we're all on a team together and certain people have responsibilities, but we're still all equals. We're in this together. And my two partners had a hard time with that concept because they were owners. Mm. And they were they would even tell me, that's fine because you're the president of the company. So everybody knows you're in charge, but they wanted to exert authority that they actually didn't have. And they would exert authority over employees that was not consistent with our values. And so one of the real bad mistakes and one of the traumas of my career was I ended up buying out my two partners. And it was not something that they wanted. Um, I mean, these it's almost like saying you got a divorce because you, you're you young, you're out of college. This was their company and their career and we were being successful. And I felt like my obligations were to the company and its future and there was problems. And so ultimately I had to buy out two partners and it was a traumatic period in my life because I felt like here are people that I've made commitments to and I am in control and the slippery slope is, are you exercising that control and that authority on a even handed or is it your self-interest? And so it was a real persecuting time for me. But it what was I a love, I know what I love Newton to interrupt you perfectly rudely and not intending to, but I, and my obligation is to the keeping the schedule here is that you have such a passion and respect for people and for the people you work with. And, and that's why your company has been so successful and why you have so much to teach us. And well, we have more questions model, for you. <laughs> that you've got a model, we've got to live by the model. Exactly. And you have to enforce it, even if it's when you're partners. And, and, and you were, yeah, and you were so good about that. So our students um, all have questions for you all. So I'm at this point gonna turn the program over to Sarah to moderate. All the students have questions. We have just 40 minutes to get through them. So <laughs> please keep your answers brief. We have like two minutes per question and answer. And uh, I know they've worked hard to, to ask y'all some really good things. So Sarah. Thank you. Okay, we will start with Elena. Hi, my name is Elena Riley. I'm a senior at Dutchtown High School and I'm the founder of FUROOS. So my question is for any of the panelists and it is, um, what, sorry, I'm like blanking for a second. <laughs> How have your companies changed during the pandemic? We'll let T take it, are yeah. you about to speak? I'll, I'll take it. We, we have an operations center. It's on Florida Boulevard, the old Bon Marche Mall, and we normally have 200 employees that operate out of that. So on March 16th, right when the, the shutdown happened, um, we realized that we were, we were going to have to work remotely. The majority of us would have to work remotely. And we were able to move um, basically 180 of those employees home and working out of their, out of their, out of their home. And since that time, we only have about 20 that have come back. So we have 160 of the employees that have, of the 200 that normally were here that are still working remotely. And they're not necessarily just working remotely because of their concern of, of pandemic. They're working remotely because it's more efficient for them. And we have a number of folks that, that live and children go to Dutchtown that work with us. And you know that's a 30 to 45 minute drive in. We have folks that live across the river and folks that live in Livingston. And that amount of time, their traffic, you know, their drive, drive time, um, they realize like, this is so much better for me. I can get up in the morning, I don't have to get dressed. I can log on the computer, I can just get going and I can work in the mornings, work in the evenings. I have time to be able to take off and, and do some other things. So um, it's, it's for us, we're one of the few organizations that as a result of interest rates going down that have actually, the business has increased during the pandemic. And we've had a lot of folks having to work a lot of hours. I will quickly chime in and I'll actually use something, a different example, not my work, but actually volunteer at the Junior League. Um, so in our organization, we volunteer in the community, but it's also a social um, organization where members get to connect um, all the time. And COVID meant that we could not do that in person. 
I would say before we were probably constrained with the idea that we always had to do things in person, that it wouldn't be the same type of member experience if you weren't meeting in person. And our organization absolutely pivoted. We created a committee that, that kind of outlined what the guidelines were that would determine when we would work together, what projects we would work on during COVID. And then we made sure to share and communicate that across our organization. And so we are still volunteering, but a lot of our work is being done virtually. So we're still able to have an impact on the community. I say all of that to say is that sometimes an organization can get stuck in your ways and there are outside factors that will force you to rethink what it is that you're doing. And you'll find that you're a stronger organization in the end. Thank you. Hey, Anmol. Hello, my name is Anmol Marotra. I'm a senior at McKinley Senior High School. My question is directed to all the panelists. How important are routines to your lives? Do you suggest any specific routines to have a successful day? Terry, you look like you're about to take that. Yeah, well, for me, so routine wise, every day my schedule was a little bit different. Some days I'd have meetings with physicians that start at 7 a.m. And almost every evening I had a dinner or a meeting or whatever. So I knew that I needed to take care of myself. I won't say that I was really good at exercising because I didn't like it, but anytime I could walk, and of course hospitals have lots of halls and stairs, I didn't take elevators, I would just try to get in exercise that way. But the one thing that I cannot do without that I made sure that I made time for was enough sleep. If I didn't get enough rest, I could not think clearly the next day. And so that was really important to me as far as my routine. The other thing that I would do is I would get up and look at all my emails and start sending emails to my staff before I actually got to the hospital if I didn't have one of those early meetings. So that by the time I got there, they would be able to provide the information back to me so that I could be more productive. I would in, encourage you to, to think about replacing the word routine with the word discipline. What are the things that I need to discipline myself to do in order to be successful? And what are the boundaries that I need to set to make certain that there is a healthy balance that remains in my life? Because not all routines are healthy. <laughs> Very well spoken. Thank you. Great guidance. Thank you. Cardell. Hey, I'm Cardell Smith from West Feliciana High, and I am the founder of Driving Life. And my question is directed to Mr. Brown. And I was just wondering how you manage working alongside a family member. You know, yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, I was been very fortunate to work with my dad um, from the time I was 24 until 1999. Um, he was he was my boss and um, he'd been a great inspiration to me. And when 1999, he decided that he wanted he wanted to just not have any employee influence in, involvement, wanted to just be the chairman, be the cheerleader which he's really good at that. He's very, got lots of optimism. And um, he turned he turned over the responsibilities to me and took off and would come in and check on things. And so it's been great. It's been a great um, situation. We, he, we, got, we know our roles. I think that's probably, I'm gonna rephrase this. Know your roles within how your response, what your responsibilities are gonna be. And it can be, a lot of times people get concerned about it, but it can be incredibly rewarding because you've got already have the love and relationship and then you can share something else together. It's uh, it can be really special. It can be divisive, but it also can be really special. I would add that it, and what T is saying is important, but going back that if you are picking a business that you're gonna do, and if you're gonna have partners, that has got the same implications of a close relationship that you've got to make sure that you're having a good communication level with someone that's a partner, that you are sharing a belief system and goals because otherwise it can create a lot of strife. Very true. Thank you both. Tyler. Hey, 
Tyler, there you go. Hi, I'm Edward Tyler. I'm a freshman at Dutch Town High School and I am founder of 360 Sports. My question is to all the panelists who attended business school, in what ways did business school education contribute to your success? I'm probably contributing too much, but I realized that my company had grown enough that I was the entrepreneur manager. And I realized that my role is the same thing that I had partners was changing. And I felt like I didn't go read books about it. I went off to Harvard. They had a graduate business program. It was unbelievably remarkable. You'd go for three weeks, three years in a row and the best professors at the Harvard Business School wanted to teach this class because to be in the class, you had to be the president CEO of the business and um, you were used to being the person in charge. And um, so they, it was um, a, a business school where you had all the different disciplines that would be required, whether it be financial, whether it be HR, whether it be strategic thinking, marketing, and you'd have professors and they did it with case studies and you would have a case study that you had read and you had classmates that were from literally all over the world. And the question was, what would you do if you were the manager in this case study? What would be the decision that you would make faced with this case? And so they'd call on you in the class you better have read the case because it would have been pretty embarrassing. And you would say what you would do if you were that person with this particular problem. And then they'd say, well, then they'd say, that was very interesting. And they'd turn to the class and say, does anybody have a different opinion? And you would then get shots from everybody else in the organization. But everyone there was someone who was running a business. And it taught you that there's so many different ways to approach a problem and you learn from your classmates as well as the professors and, and about one out of every four, the person that was in the case study would come in and then say, this is what I did, here was my decision and talk about whether it worked or not. So it was an unbelievably dynamic learning process as a, as a business school. And I really have valued it ever since I attended it. And uh, I've got friendships that 10 years later, we still spend a lot of time together where because you knew everyone else in the program because your answers were personal. This is what I would do if I was confronted with a problem. And uh, so you spoke from the heart. You didn't say, here's what the book said. You're saying, what would I do? And you came to understand your classmates and so. It was a wonderful experience. And I'm sure that there are other, I know LSU has got a program and I know there are other places, but I, I went off because of the allure of Harvard and I went to that and um, it was very like meaningful a, and I learned a lot. Great experience. Thank you, Gabby. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Duncan. I'm a senior at Walker High School and I'm the founder of Just a Snap. My question goes out to all the panelists and it is how do you um, go about ensuring inclusion and belonging in your business? Marisha, you wanna take that? Sure, um, I do, I mean, it is about intentionality. Um, and I think that a lot of times people lean on this easy answer that it's not easy to find um, someone, but I think that um, people have to be thoughtful about who exists in their network. Is their network, um, one, is their network diverse? If it's not diverse, how do they make their network much more diverse so that when you are reaching out for a talent um, that is diverse, whether that is in gender or in ethnicity or in thought, um, that you have multiple areas um, that you can tap into. I just Anybody want to, else want to add in? Yeah, I, I just think it goes back to what Newton said early on, and it is about what are the values that you uh, establish. Uh, and, and so, for example, one of the values that, that we hold to at Metro Morphosis is, is chemistry. Uh, 
uh, and, and, and relationships. And so I think that, that what you value, you, you measure, you pay attention to, uh, and you ultimately, as Norisha said, you become very intentional about it. And so it has to move from being just a word you say to being something that you, uh, that you hold yourself accountable for. Well, and there's actually a business case for inclusion. There are many, many articles, particularly Catalyst writes articles every year regarding how much better businesses perform when they have diverse and inclusive boards, administrative staffs, and team members that are empowered and have an opportunity to participate in decision-making. Every decision is gonna be better when you have a lot of input, a lot of people commenting on it. Um, the leader is not responsible for making the decision at the beginning and helping the, trying to bring the others along. It is receiving advice from a very trusted team that is inclusive of, of, of based on a lot of factors, not just the more demographic ones, but a lot of other factors as well. And that's the leader's responsibility is to make the right decision after listening to all of the advisors that have provided the information in a very collaborative way, in my opinion. Excellent, thank Great. you. Sarah? Jalen. You're muted, Sarah, yeah. Jalen, can you unmute? There we go, there you go. Hi, my name is Jalen Carter. I'm a freshman in the Early Art College program through Donsonville High School, and I'm the founder of Creative Kisses. My question goes out to all the panelists. How did you go about choosing the specific organizations where you volunteer? Well, for me, it's organizations that I'm passionate about. It started out uh, being some local organizations. Right now on the Companion Animal Alliance board locally, I am very passionate about companion animals and shelters and mistreatment of uh, pets. So I think it goes back to that passion. When in my uh, career, I was associated with many organizations and associations that were helping to advance the causes and the benefits and the, the advocacy of healthcare, particularly around women and infants. Anybody else real quick, super quick? Um, I will say for me, I actually personally had a goal of trying to visit every major zoo around the United States because I just love zoos. And I shared that with Carolyn McKnight, a woman who I know, and eventually found my way onto the zoo board. And then I would say the other part of me that's being passionate about education was how when I moved back here, someone connected me to Sarah Broom, who was the founder of Thrive. And I was a founding board chair there because I wanted to make sure wherever community I was living in, that I was contributing um, to making sure that um, there are great schools out there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. My okay. comment would be, and my, this is me personally, I didn't believe that I wanted to be on a lot of boards. You have opportunities. I believe that you narrow that very down and, and only be in a, involved with a couple of, and then commit yourself to it. And whether it be resources or time, commit yourself to the things that you've got time to do meaningfully. To me, it was not to build a resume that you've got all these things that you associated with. It was to try to make a, identify organizations that you identified with their mission and then try to invest enough time and or financial resources to truly be helpful. Excellent, awesome. thank you. Sarah? Joey Roth, please. Hi, my name is Joey Roth. I am a freshman at Episcopal School of Baton Rouge, and I am the founder of Chef's Way. My question is for Mr. Brown. I was surprised to learn recently that there that real estate sales have been strong during the pandemic, and that seems almost a bit counterintuitive. What do you think is driving this trend? Well, that is a very good question, and I couldn't agree with you more. It does seem incredibly uh, counterintuitive because, you know, when what we've seen is interest rates drop significantly in March of 2020 uh, as a result of, of the pandemic and the shutdown of, of, the, uh, of the economy. I thought that I knew at that time we were gonna see a, a tremendous amount of refinance activity where people are refinancing the current mortgage and lowering their rate from whatever it is, taking advantage of, of today's rate. What I didn't foresee 
was a significant increase in purchases, people buying new home loans. Uh, I felt like that was going to be um, you know, a big pullback there because I was like, who buys a home in the middle of a pandemic? You can't even go in to see the home. Uh, but I think part of it is people were confined to their home and they're now working from their home and maybe their home didn't have all the resources it needed in order to provide the, the, uh, the, the environment that they needed in order to be successful. Uh, and so I think that's part of it. But I do think rates are also a big driver. I mean, rates are still at these historically low rates. I mean, we're seeing 30 year fix at two and a half percent. It's just, it's an incredible time, but this time will pass. I try to tell everybody that it's great right <laughs> now, but this time will pass. Take advantage of it. It has Thanks. been an interesting trend. Thank you, Joey. Sarah, Luke. You're on mute, Luke. Hi, my name is Luke Williams. I'm currently a junior attending Santa Mall High and I'm co-founder of Your Atlas. Today, my question is for Ms. Fontenot. Ms. Fontenot, with your experiences, what recommendations do you have on ways to avoid uh, common financial pitfalls in startups? Terry, you're on mute too. I'm not sure that it's any different for startups than it is in ongoing concerns. I'm a big believer in taking informed risk. And there's a lot of analysis. And now with the ease in collecting data, external as well as internal, I think if you can have enough information in order and recognize what the risks are and then have a plan for mitigating those risks. So what if this goes? sideways, then what is your plan B? And think through all those different scenarios prior to launching that particular startup or that particular risky project. For, for me, the risky project was building a replacement hospital that cost $350 million 10 years ago. And we, were, uh, we, had, had, eight, we had already spent $80 million starting it before we actually went to the bond market, which crashed related to what T was talking about, we had to put the whole project on ice for a year. But we knew that our plan was sound. We just waited it out till the interest rates dropped. And we, during that time, we, we took time to refine the design of it. And we took about $50 million of costs out of it too. So I would, I would say the, uh, in summary, just understand what your risks are, how you might mitigate those. And then the other financial advice would be Make sure you start with enough capital. Don't underfund it from the beginning because it, you, it's so hard to dig out of that and you'll end up spending more. Great advice. Thank you so much. Mateo. Hello, I'm Mateo Cheney Martinez. I am a senior at University View Academy, which is an online school, which gives me the incredible opportunity to be an early college student at Southeastern Louisiana University. And I'm also the founder of Smart Start University, my business. My question is for the entire panel. In my, in my conversations with entrepreneurs, one of the things I've noticed is a lot of people have an epiphany or two that really transform their understanding of business. In one to two sentences, can you guys condense what might be your most important epiphany that you've learned in business? Everybody can answer if they do it in 30 seconds each. I won't call it an epiphany, but it is a statement that was shared with us when I went to the Goldman Sachs program. And they said, as an entrepreneur, it's important for us to work on our business and not in our business. And what that mean by that is that you can get so mired in the details of the things that are going on day to day that you end up becoming stagnant as a business because you're not focusing on the big picture and overall and being strategic about the direction that you want to go. So focus on your business, not in your business. Reverend Jetson, do you have anything to add? For me, the, the, the moment was recognizing that I could do well. In other words, that I could build an enterprise that hired people, that uh, paid uh, decent salaries to people, while at the same time making a difference in the world around me. So the whole reality that I could do well while doing good uh, was an important moment for me. Anybody else want to add real quick? I right, laugh because in, in, in my business, you know, I, I, we talk, I earlier was talking about the values and, you know, I 
gave the management of the company to the employees and they take great pride and tease me all the time because they're doing better without me. And uh, that was for me a very, I mean, uh, and I, in, in all candor, it's not something, obviously I don't resent it. It just makes me feel with pride when my people that have come behind me uh, are doing even better managing it themselves. I mean, it just is rewarding as it could be as a, as a entrepreneur to see that people share your vision and are then gonna turn around and, and really excel. And um, that's very rewarding. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Matthew. guys. Matthew Rotolo. Hi, I'm Matthew Rotolo. I'm a junior at Walker High School and I'm the founder of Wildcat Wireless. Um, my question is directed to Mr. Thomas. Um, Mr. Thomas, what were the driving forces that led you to leave your position at Southern Instruments and form your new company? <laughs> Well, I'll try to keep it as a very short story, but uh, they made me the manager. The company was going through problems and it was their solution. They made me manager. And I went to them and said, look, will you allow me to put in place a bonus program that will share 10% of the profit of the company with the employees that I can designate who gets it? Doesn't include me, it includes the employees. But I wanna incentivize our employees I think that will enable me to really be successful. And um, we proceeded to go have an unbelievable, profitable year, unbelievably strong cash flow. And so I was very excited. And every month when we're doing our statements, I would be developing based on the profit, I would be, here's how much money I've got. And I had a very established list. And, my, and I went to the home office and I had my list because I was going to, they were going to approve this. And of course, I had communicated it to the employees. And um, so I went up there with the parent company and I showed them the list. And they said, well, look, you can't pay those bonuses. And, I, and they said, because it's going to create, you know, you're going to, you're giving out quite a bit of money and it'll create a problem in our company with all of our existing employees. I said, well, I can relate to your answer only, but you should have given that to me before I announced it. I announced this to our employees. I have put my name on the line. And if I committed to it, I've got to do it. I can't back out of this because I made a personal commitment. They said, well, you can't pay it. And I said, well, then you're going to have to fire me because I'm going to pay it if I work there. And um, once again, I'm not normally considered regimented with the authority. And, and this is back before cell phones. So I, I mean, they, I'm going to my car and I'm trying to think where can I find a pay phone? Cause I'm going to call the controller and tell him hand out the checks. That was my last great act of defiance. And they got me in the parking lot. Okay. And they caught me in the parking lot, brought me back in and they said, well, if you're going to leave, then we'll let you pay it. And the conclusion for me quite simply was, well, fine, I'm going to pay it. Obviously, there's no point in discussing what you'd be willing to do for me because I'm not on the list. I'm not getting anything. And we've turned this company around and we're unbelievably successful. But I basically said, I, I can't work for these people. They're breaking commitments that are just not right. And... Um, so I knew I had to leave. And I, when they had bought the company, I had to sign a non-compete agreement because I was a very, very small owner. And so in theory, I couldn't, you know, what are you gonna do with your life now? You can't even compete. But the, the, deal, the good part of it was, if they fired me without cause, they had to pay me three years of salary under my non-compete agreement. And there was no cause that they could fire me because I was enforcing an agreement they had agreed to. And um, so actually my, I went for a period of about six months where I was wondering if a shoe was gonna drop, where I was gonna be sued because I went into competition with them. And uh, they didn't sue and it took us two years and we put that division out of business, okay? 
because wow. none of the people had any loyalty to the parent company, which is very standard in a lot of corporate worlds. If you're in a division, you know, the division you're in is where your loyalty lies, not necessarily a, so me, but I found myself haunted by the things that had driven me early on that corporate America sometimes doesn't handle things the way honorably or the right way with a people endeavor. So I That's just realized- That's a very good work. reason. Sounds like a very good reason to, to then go start your own where you were able to, to treat your employees uh, the way you saw fit. So great story there. Thank you. Thank you. Morgan. All right, hi, I'm Morgan. I'm a junior in River Parish Communities, Community Colleges Early College Option Program through Santa Mar High School. I'm the founder of your Atlas, and my question is to all the panelists. What is one thing that is important to know before owning a business that you were never told? <laughs> See? It's going to be hard. <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it is. Nice. It, you know, it, it, there's going to be things that you just, you find that are, that, you know, come up every day and you have to deal with that. But it's, uh, as hard as it is, the reward is 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 that much greater. You know, it's it's an it's an exciting time for for you guys to be looking at at the various businesses that you're looking to to launch. And you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of capital in the market right now. Um, and I, and I think there's a great opportunity for for people of y'all's age to be able to catch some attention of some of these foundations. One of the things I wanted to mention the LSU. Business School as the Venture Challenge. We, we did it last year. It's the J. Terrell Brown Venture Challenge. Uh, and it's, uh, so if you're going to LSU, if you're going to any Louisiana school, you can apply through the Business School program. And it's 25, it's gonna be $50,000 this year. Um, that's gonna be um, given away to the various uh, various winners. And so keep, keep y'all's progress going and keep looking at, at different opportunities. Brew was just last week and there was $50,000 that went went to the winner of that. OmniDeck was a winner of that this year and, and they got $50,000 to help fund their, their business. So look at the different brew and LSU and, and other organizations out there that, that are really supporting the entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. And doesn't matter how old you are, you can come and, and, and pitch. It's a great question, Thanks. Morgan. And I would love to let everybody weigh in, but we only have 10 more minutes and we have about nine more questions to get through. So Sarah? Maya. Hi, my name is Maya Bisley, Maya Bisley and I'm a junior at Liberty Magnet High School. Um, I'm the co-founder of Afro Next, and my question is to all the panelists. Um, what are the benefits of community involvement like for your business? The benefit is in seeing a difference being made in the lives of people who matter to you. And so if you are concerned about the community, when you are able to use your, your business to make a difference in the lives of people, whether they are your customers or the people who work with you, uh, it is one of the most rewarding experiences you will have in life. Well, it's a great networking opportunity as well. It's an opportunity to let others know about the work that your organization is doing. And it's also a great way to identify individuals who can help you in your business. So I think it, it goes both ways, but um, just getting out and learning best practices, understanding what other people are doing and being able to bring that into your organization is extremely valuable. Thank you, Sarah. Parker. Hi, I'm Parker St. Romain. I am a senior at Catholic High School and I'm the CEO of Go Voyage. And my question is for Mr. Jetson and it will be, how would you define success? When you see the lives of people who matter to you being enhanced, again, the people who work with you, 
uh, the team of people who, who, who are part of building the vision, when you see their growth, uh, when you are able uh, to, to, to pay people a quality salary and to see their lives better, as well as the people you're seeking to impact through your business, when lives are being made, when, when things are different. Uh, on my Twitter account, I, uh, five days a week, I send my first tweet in the morning is, what will you do today that will matter 20 years from now? And so doing something that makes a difference in the lives of others lives on far beyond uh, our, our time here. That's wonderful. Thank you, Reverend Jetson. Sarah? Quentin. Hi to all panelists. My name is Quentin Messer. I am a junior at the Episcopal School of Baton Rouge and my business is Modell. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for all the panelists' uh, time and uh, insight. My question is, uh, you know, given the COVID pandemic, there's been significant changes in leadership. And what, I guess, what is the most significant change that you guys have had to make in the way you lead your organizations? Who wants to take that? So I think for, for us, um, as a result of all of the, you know, remote working, it's been, it's been more difficult from a managerial standpoint to, to be able to just, you know, have the impromptu discussions and, and being able to just walk next door to somebody's office and say, hey, by the way, I was thinking about this and what about this? And so you don't get the water cooler discussion that, that you otherwise, you know, used to have. And so I think you have to become more intentional about staying in touch with, you know, the, the, the management group. We have a weekly management meeting, but that's, that's fine. But it's, it's the other impromptu components of just catching up with people that that we're missing and, and it, it's a challenge. Anybody else? Narisha, you wanna weigh in real, real quick on that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great, Serenity. Hi, my name is Serenity Hilaire. Um, I'm a sophomore at East Central High School and the founder of Invisible. This question is directed at all panelists. During your years of being a business leader, what is the most challenging obstacles you faced and how do you overcome it? I don't know if y'all, her, her video was a little bit slow. What was the most, one of the biggest obstacles you faced and how did you overcome it? So I'll, I'll answer if you don't mind. Um, and that is, um, the construction industry is dominated by men. Um, it is dominated by white men. It's dominated by people who are um, who are significantly older than me, although there are definitely young players in the field. And also I like to make the joke, you can't tell here I'm 4'11", so it's also dominated by people who are taller than me. Um, a lot of it was about um, letting people know that like women can be in construction as well. So often I'd walk into rooms, people wanted to know if I was the interior decorator, if I was the supplier or vendor and letting them know that no, I was here as a general contractor to manage the entirety of a project um, was, I don't know that I wanna call it a challenge, it's just something that like I had to get used to. It never shied me away from doing the work, but being confident in who I, who I am and knowing that I would be able to deliver um, allowed me to ignore the comments that were often thrown my way and allowed me, it, it fueled me um, to do a better job um, on any of the projects that, that I encountered. Thank I'm you. I'm so glad you got that question in Serenity. That was great, Narisha, thanks. Sarah. Sia. Hi, my name is Sia Kumar. I'm in the ninth grade and I go to Baton Rouge Magnet High School. I'm the founder of LeVan. My question for you is how do you achieve a healthy work-life balance? A healthy. A healthy work-life balance? Who has one? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that, that the, the word that I used earlier was discipline. You have to discipline yourself. Uh, what matters to you, you make time for. And so it, it, it's creating that balance, understanding the boundaries and recognizing that there are things that contribute to a healthy balance and there are things that don't. And so understanding what they are and disciplining yourself uh, to practice them on an ongoing basis is the key. And I prefer to think of it not as work-life balance, but blending. 
these days, particularly with technology and being able to work anywhere, it's, it's, I, it, it can be a challenge to turn off the work part of it, but it also gives you a level of freedom so that you can mix during the day and during your week the things that are important to you personally as well as professionally. So it's, it's back to managing, and I think um, Reverend Jetson's right, the discipline, but it's also uh, releasing yourself, particularly for women who have families. You feel guilty when you're working that you're not paying enough attention to your family and you feel guilty when you're with your family that you ought to be working. Look at, I see Stephanie and Arisha. <laughs> not, but when Very I learned true. that I shouldn't try to pigeonhole it, that it just needs to be thought of as blending and doing what I need to do that day, whether it's personal or business or whatever aspect of my life, it really liberated me mentally and emotionally. Thank you. And I think we have one more, Sarah. We do. Sydney. Hello, I'm Sydney Hubbard and I'm a junior at Dutchtown High School and co-founder of Afronext. My question is for all panelists. Have you ever found that your gender or race has been a barrier to you in the professional world? And how did it lead to personal growth or entrepreneurial growth? So I'll dive in. And one of, one of the realities is that there are people uh, around us who are challenged by issues of, 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 of race. Uh, that's their problem, uh, not, not yours. Yeah. Uh, and so you can't allow other people's problems to become barriers to your progress. And the reality is that you have to keep going. You have to be driven and you can't allow small people uh, to deter you from achieving big dreams. We have about one minute left. If anybody would like to add oh. something in less than 60 seconds to that beautiful okay. ending by Reverend Judson. So what I will add is that sometimes what people might see as a barrier is actually an opportunity. And what I found when I actually started my business in 2015, but went full time in 2016, I really started focusing on residential houses and that's when the flood took place. And actually people were comforted with me as a contractor because there was some presumed honesty or integrity because I was a woman. And I didn't expect that to like be the case. So where sometimes people will see things as a barrier, ignore them and take that same thing they see as a barrier and figure out how that is an opportunity um, that serves and benefits you and the people that you're serving. That's great, Narisha. Sydney, thanks for a great question. Students, y'all all, you all so had much. wonderful questions. Great. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Uh, we're going to we wrap have... up and I'll let Sarah conclude. Yes, well, we have everyone here. We would love to, to highlight everyone, big smiles and, and waves. You all did an amazing job tonight. Students, if you could wave for us and we'll see all of you here. Uh, thank you to everyone. And uh, just a couple of more things here tonight. To our students, keep up the hard work. This is a reminder, there's still a lot of work to be done. So continue the work on your business plans this week in Google Docs, fine tuning your pitch slides, uh, posting those updates to Microsoft Teams so that we and your mentors can see your updates there. Lots of work to be done. And thank you again to all of you for being our guests tonight, our panelists, our students, you all were amazing. We do hope that we will see you all at our investor panel on March 3rd. And please join me one more time here in a round of applause for our students and panelists. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you for having us.